KC 18115L, State of Washington et al. versus United States Department of State et al. Council, would you please make your appearances? Jeff Rupert, Assistant Attorney General for the uh, Plaintiff States. And Jeff Sprung, Assistant Attorney General. Kristen Vanesky, Assistant Attorney General for the State of Washington. Zach Jones, Assistant Attorney General, State of Washington. Mr. Jones. Scott Kaplan, Assistant Attorney General for the State of Oregon. Who's also a member of the bar of the State of Washington. Yes, Your Honor. Great. Good morning, Your Honor. Stephen Myers on behalf of the Federal Defendants. Mr. Myers, are you all alone representing the entire United States of America? I am, Your Honor, yes. Okay, we appreciate that. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Joel Ard for the Defendants Second Amendment Foundation, Defense Distributed, and Con Williamson. Uh, Your Honor, Matthew Goldstein for the Private Party Defendants, uh, Con Williamson, Defense Distributed, and uh, Second Amendment Foundation. Sure. Dan Hammond for Defense Distributed. Your Honor, my name is Chad Flores. I represent Defense Distributed, and I'll be giving the argument for all of the private defense. Welcome, Mr. Flores. Thank you. All right. Well, we are here on uh, the follow-up to the temporary restraining order and arguing today on whether the court should issue a preliminary injunction in this case. And I believe we will start with Mr. Rupert. Uh, and uh, there was an indication that, Mr. Sprung, you would address uh, a Second Amendment issue if it came up. Is that right? Okay, I think I might save that for rebuttal, but thanks for letting me know. So, uh, Mr. Rupert, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the State Department voluntarily entered into a settlement agreement with an organization run by a crypto anarchist. Uh, the State Department has chosen to give access to potentially untraceable and undetectable firearms to any terrorists felon or domestic abuser with a laptop and a 3D printer. Uh, this court granted a temporary restraining order and we're now asking the court to convert that to a preliminary injunction. Now, we have procedural claims, that's the 30-day notice to Congress and the Department of Defense concurrence, as well as an arbitrary and capricious claim. The order I was going to address it in, unless Your Honor wanted me to go in a different order, was going to address irreparable harm first, because that seems to be the main challenge by the government, <coughs> then likelihood of success on the merits, standing, that's uh, fine. Yeah. Then First Amendment. Mm -hmm. As far as irreparable harm, the government's chief contention is that uh, the harms that the states have identified in their many declarations cannot be traced to the government's actions. Uh, I think that's thoroughly rebutted by the evidence in the record, in fact, by the government's own prior filings in the Texas litigation. Notably, in the in April 2018 brief, the government argued that the Internet does not have separate parts, domestic and foreign. It's all one Internet. So once this information goes online, it's going to be available. And as the court noted in its prior temporary restraining order decision, that the proliferation of these firearms will have many of the negative impacts on the state level that the federal government once feared on an international stage. And the court then quoted a number of the, uh, the government's uh, own words against them, or not against them, excuse me, just as illustrative from the briefing. But I'd also highlight the declaration of Lisa Aguirre, or Aguirre, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, but she talked about the potential for terrorist groups using such weapons against the United States. Well, the states are part of the United States, so we believe that the government's own evidence demonstrates that uh, the government's well aware that significant harm could occur to the states. Uh, if, this, uh, if its rulings are, are permitted to stand here. One of the central issues that is the cause for the harm is the widespread use of metal detectors. Now, we've, we've submitted numerous declarations about metal detectors and uh, how they are used and how they do not pick up these uh, plastic guns. But I'd highlight the declaration from Mary McCord. She was the acting assistant attorney general for national security uh, retiring in May 2017, but she oversaw all federal counterterrorism, counter espionage, and export control prosecutions, including prosecutions of terrorists. And she uh, details the, the difficulties that would uh, occur uh, if these guns become prevalent because they're just not picked up by metal detectors. Uh, and that's well known by the government. It's in Lisa Aguirre's declaration as well. Uh, and then there's numerous other declarations that make the same point. But metal detectors, as are in the declarations, are used throughout the United States in airports, the courthouse, in fact, the courthouse downstairs, uh, government buildings, prisons, stadiums, even schools. Uh, 
Uh, one of the interesting things one of the experts pointed out, I hadn't even thought about that, with 3D printers in schools, if the school has a metal detector, uh, the gun could be printed in the school, even evading it further. Now, this all demonstrates the public safety concern that the states have raised here by the government's uh, sweeping change of its position that it had for five years. Now, the states have uh, numerous laws about who, can, uh, who is prohibited from uh, owning a gun, uh, such as felons, domestic abusers, those with mental health issues or, or age. And we have background checks that uh, are, are used to, uh, uh, to identify those folks. Some states even have limits on the manufacturing of a gun. Uh, Massachusetts does, for instance, New Jersey does as well. Well, all of those could easily be evaded, again, with a printer, uh, a 3D printer and these files. And then the issue becomes uh, just identified, you know, the metal detectors are, are not going to be useful at all. Just a few other points I'll highlight on irreparable harm and then I'll move on. Uh, I want to just uh, focus on for a moment the deposition of Professor Patel at the University of Washington, who's the MacArthur Genius Fellow. He talks about how 3D pr printing works now and that this Liberator gun can easily be printed, but then also discusses the advances that you know, he believes, in his opinion, will occur rapidly in this area, that the technology will proceed far, be far better than we currently have as new gun designs come out and, frankly, that the uh, 3D printing advances. I also want to highlight that uh, the 3D guns will, will spread, and by that I'm referring to the declaration from Ron Hosko. He's a 30-year career FBI agent. Uh, he was an assist assistant director of the FBI's criminal investigative division and led the Bureau's largest program worldwide. Uh, but his declaration discusses his experiences and his belief that uh, the 3D printers will be embraced by criminal enterprises uh, you know, if it becomes available. Uh, one other thing to highlight, and then I'll kind of go on to a few other points here, is that uh, we do know from the declaration from Blake Graham from the special agent for the California Department of Justice that ghost guns, these are the metal guns that don't have uh, any uh, identifier on them. They are emerging more and more in California and they've been used in a number of mass shootings. Uh, there's heightened risk of terrorist attack, attacks. I mean, the Aguirre and McCord declarations detail those. And then the ability of law enforcement to use serial numbers to, uh, to, to, to solve crimes uh, would be greatly compromised if these became widespread. And there I point to the declaration of John Camper from the uh, Colorado Bureau of Investigation. Uh, who they did some testing on these guns and uh, they set, uh, concluded that standard forensic techniques cannot be applied to link a projectile or bullet to a particular 3D printed firearm. Uh, and that's because the barrel's not rifled and the firing conditions can't be replicated and frankly it was unsafe to fire some of the guns. You know, one of the things we hear in response is, well, the Undetectable Firearms Act, you know, th that covers this. So, you know, why are you complaining states? Well, uh, as Mary McCord in her declaration notes that the Undetected Firearms Act does nothing to deter terrorists or bad actors from making a 3D weapon. In fact, you know, the, the, uh, the current system has firearms dealers whose livelihood depends on compliance with federal and state law, but those will be removed if these become widespread. I think uh, Chief Best from the Seattle Police Department summed it up best, but you know, if we have uh, you know, 3D guns, you know, such a world will be more dangerous for the public and uh, for the police officers, officers whose job it is to protect the public. So we believe the irreparable harm element has been shown to grant a preliminary injunction. And we note that there's no evidence to the contrary submitted to the, by, the, by the government or the other private defendants. Turning now to a likelihood of success on the merits. As we discussed last time, I think it's pretty clear the items are on the munitions list. I mean, the, governor, the government has taken that position for five years starting in 2013 all the way up to April 2018 in court filings. They then took two actions to remove the items from the munitions list, the temporary modification and the letter. Now, both require notice, 30 days notice to Congress, and that's the statute that requires that 2778F1. Now, there's no dispute that the notice to Congress was not given, and that's in the record with the declarations from Representative Engel as well as the letter from Senator, Men Senator Menendez. The position of the government is, though, that it wasn't required because the, they believe that the statute, when it refers to items, is actually referring to a category or subcategories of items. Now, we've discussed this in the brief, but we don't believe that finds support. Uh, 
uh, in the, the actual text of the statute or the case law. Uh, and they also talk about Skidmore defense, but Skidmore doesn't apply if the statute's unambiguous. In support, we would highlight the CFR section that we, we highlighted, as well as the case law, which distinguishes between categories and items. And even the executive order that we have at issue refers to items or categories of items. And if, you, if an item is a category, it wouldn't make any sense. So we believe that uh, item, that, that this, when these were removed, that notice was required, and there was no dispute that it was not given. Mr. Rupert, uh, when we first met, the absence of 30 days notice was particularly acute because we had, we were acting on virtually no notice whatsoever. Um, now Congress obviously has, if, even if they haven't received the official notice, they're on notice and they will have had about 30 days to act. I think it's fairly obvious they're not going to act. So what is the irreparable harm of not giving the notice? For sure. Well, actually, the notice, if you look at the statute provision, it requires the notice shall describe the nature of any controls to be imposed on that item under any other provision of law. Now, it's just not clear what the position the government's taking, you know, if it is going to do anything to uh, pr protect these weapons under another mechanism or not. And it is a formal mechanism to Congress that is required to, to be done. And again, it's a procedural claim, but it was not done. The other procedural claim that we identified was the concurrence of the Secretary of Defense. And there's a bit of a dispute about whether that's reviewable. We believe it is, but based on the City of Carmel case from the Ninth Circuit, uh, the government had cited a, uh, a district court decision out of the, the D.C., uh, the, uh, DC, the Defender of Wildlife case, uh, which had some of the similar language, but I would say the Defender of Wildlife case noticeably has a section labeled Application and Judicial Review. Uh, that's not in the executive order that we have here, and we believe, therefore, that the city of Carmel case controls. So as far as the de Department of Defense, the declaration submitted by the government uh, trying to explain what did occur, uh, there's no mention in that declaration whatsoever that the Department of Defense concurred in the temporary modification. Uh, I will say, though, that th that declaration does say that the Department of Defense concurred in the letter. Now, there's no details about the date, time, or the person that gave it, but it does say that. Now, I would note that there's a distinction between the letter and the modification, too. The letter addresses just the specific articles uh, that were at issue. That, by that's the Liberator uh, gun and a few other items. The modification, on the other hand, was much broader because that covered uh, not only the guns that, you know, the designs that uh, had been submitted, but as well as any future 3D guns that might be uh, submitted by uh, private defendants or anyone else. So that's the much broader one, that there's no concurrence from the Department of Defense. And just to give background here, removals from the munitions list rarely occur. And that I'm referring to the declaration from Representative Engel as, whether, as well as Senator Menendez's letter. And they explained the usual process that occurs where, while 30 days is what's required statutorily, often it's far greater than that. And the Department of Defense is involved in this whole process. And that just wasn't done here. I want to move to the arbitrary and capricious claim. Now, we don't have the record here, and we will need that for when we reach the final merits of this, but we believe there is sufficient information before you right now to demonstrate a likelihood of success on the merits. And that's because of the following. First, there's a prior uh, CJ determination in 2015, as well as the Aguirre declarations that have findings that these items need to be on the munitions list for national security reasons. And they also detail that the harm that would occur if they were removed. Second, the government in past litigation filings for over three years said essentially the same thing, discussing the harms and the need for national security for these items to remain on the munitions list. And the third, I would cite the Haidema Declaration that the government has submitted uh, in opposition. Now, this declaration uh, details the government's rationale for making its decision. Now, it does, as I mentioned, uh, address the concurrence to the letter for, by the Department of Defense, but it's notable about what is not in this declaration. This declaration doesn't say there's any justification, rationale, or findings for the government's change in position from 2015 in the CJ or the Aguirre Declaration to now. The government's declaration does not say there's any national security or public safety. It doesn't even mention at all about putting these guns out there. And there's, uh, the government doesn't say that the new CJ was done. 
What the government does rely on is proposed rulemaking that it has done to move some items from uh, category one of the munitions list over to the uh, Commerce Department. But this can't be a basis for this decision, at least one, if it is, it's an arbitrary and capricious one, because it would be an attempt to make an end run around the, around the rulemaking process. Because these rules are not final, we don't know what will come out of it, in fact. And if they're trying to short circuit the rulemaking process by using this modification, uh, well, I think it fails right there as arbitrary and capricious. And then more telling, I would look at the actual rationale that they, they identify for moving items from the munitions list over to commerce. And I'm referring to paragraph 19 of, uh, of Ms. Heidema's declaration. She refers to the transfer of certain items was informed by the Defense Department's assessment that the items proposed for transfer are already commonly available. Well, we know plastic guns are not commonly available, so if that's the rationale for the government's decision now to make plastic guns available, not even the declaration supports that. We believe it's arbitrary and capricious. And one of the other items in 19, paragraph 19 that's highlighted is that little national security concern is highlighted by the fact that the Department of Defense does not generally review export license applications for the physical items described in category one as the department does for license applications in other categories. Well, we know that, that they actually did review this one here. That's the 2015 CJ determination. So again, this declaration by Ms. Heidem of trying to justify uh, the government's decisions in this case actually does not justify it at all and shows the arbitrary nature of it. And the final thing, uh, a few or two other things to highlight. Uh, there has been suggestions by the private defendants that the First Amendment was a factor in this analysis, but Ms. Heidemann's declaration makes clear that the department denies and continues to deny that it violated the First or Second uh, amend Amendment or acted in ultra-virus. So that was not the rationale either. Uh, and then finally, uh, just I'm not quite sure how best to categorize it because it's so unusual, it's hard to find any case law on this, is we have the president himself tweeting uh, that this doesn't seem to make it much sense. Uh, and that's not quite the legal standard, but ultimately that's what is an arbitrary and capricious decision. Does this make sense or not? And we believe that based on Ms. Heidemann's declaration as well as uh, the prior declarations and 2015 CJ determination that it does not. I'm just going to move on to standing unless the court had any questions about uh, uh, the likelihood of success on the merits. Now, on the Heidema Declaration, she's not somebody who was brought in in a new administration or anything like that. It seems like she's been part of the government agencies that, that have been looking at this for several years. Um, the federal defendants have made the argument that this was a kind of boring, bureaucratic look at something and just happened to cover the 3D guns, but it wasn't set out to change things uh, in particular to that. It was this 50 caliber or below. Um, what, what evidence do, do the states have that this really was a setup to change the 3D guns rather than a bureaucratic process that could put anyone to sleep? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think the timing is the, the, one of the big questions that we have throughout this whole thing, the way uh, it was revealed at certain times, the settlement. Uh, but uh, overall, though, I mean, regardless of why it was done, about what's in that declaration versus what is not. Again, the case law is clear on arbitrary and capriciousness. If you're going to make a significant change, you need to have a rationale for it. It doesn't need to be a better rationale, but you do need to have a rationale. And none is identified in this declaration. Because as I, as I pointed out, you know, there, this doesn't apply to plastic guns, the rationale that they have, that it's readily available, the guns. And cause that's just not so for plastic guns. So the action may not be arbitrary and capricious to the larger categories, but its impact on the plastic gun issue is? Correct. That's why we do wonder what will come out in the final rulemaking, which we don't know. But you do wonder, does do plastic guns get accepted from the final rulemaking? And we'll just have to see what they do, and then we'll have to see whether there's any challenges to that. Okay, you can move on now to standing. Sure. Uh, as we discussed last last time, you know, standings, uh, you know, injury in fact, traceability, and redressability. But these requirements are relaxed in the APA case. Uh, the state has standing if it's either sovereign, quasi-sovereign, or proprietary interest. 
And, but I want to highlight the Massachusetts versus EPA case that talks about the special solicitude in the standing analysis, uh, because that does you know change it somewhat when states are involved, and uh, that was applied you know for the EPA case, and it was also recently applied in the Texas versus United States case uh, that was affirmed by an equally divided court in 2016. This is, uh, I think, pretty well laid out in the brief, so I was going to move through it somewhat quickly. Uh, the states have a sovereign interest to, uh, to create and enforce the legal code, and we believe that the government's actions underforces our ability to enforce the statutory codes, and we have multiple declarations that support that. The, it also undermines the maintenance and recognition of borders, uh, because this will allow uh, guns, based on the McCord Declaration, to come across to, uh, the borders by air, sea, and water. Uh, it also affects the police power because uh, it seriously impends the, it impedes the ability to protect uh, residents from injury and death, and there's numerous declarations that go into that. On the proprietary standing, uh, the state has submitted declarations uh, relating to its jails, because uh, metal, metal detectors are widely used there, and if this technology, that technology being 3D guns, is widely implemented, the metal detectors are going to have a significant hole, and we're either going to have to buy a whole new a wave of technology to scan folks when they come back in or guests that come in, or we're going to have to do hand searches. So there's going to be significant expense involved. And the same with law enforcement. Anybody who's relying on a metal detector is going to have to upgrade their technology uh, if the, such technology exists, or they're going to have to go to more hand searches, which is going to be more uh, intensive and require more manpower. So we believe that's the proprietary interest right there. And then as far as quasi-sovereign, uh, we believe there's, again, a threat to, similar to the sovereign and proprietary, a threat to uh, safety and physical well-being of the state's residents by making these weapons far more available. It somewhat dovetails with what I've already discussed about irreparable harm. The next part of a standing analysis is zone of interest and prudential standing. This is not meant to be an especially demanding test, and it's agency action is presumptively re re uh, reviewable. Uh, when you look at the AECA itself, it's intended to protect, to protect domestic security by restricting the flow of military information abroad, but it does so in the furtherance of world peace and the security and foreign policy of the United States. Well, as I said before, the states are the United States. Uh, if this is going to, if, if we're doing it to protect national security, we're certainly doing it to protect the states. And we have declarations in the record that talk about uh, these guns flowing across our borders or the potential that somebody, you know, in a foreign country could uh, seize an airplane by uh, getting onto the airplane in a foreign country and flying it towards the states. Uh, I was going to move on to the First Amendment issues, unless the, Your Honor had uh, any questions about standing. We believe the First Amendment is irrelevant to the merits of the case. And we do that because you know, the government, in the Heidemann Declaration, states that they didn't rely on the First Amendment in make, deciding these decisions. Now, I do believe the court should consider the First Amendment when it balances the equities you know, and that element of the, the temporary restraining order. Now, we believe it's an easy decision there, though, because uh, Judge Pittman has uh, already done that review, uh, albeit on a somewhat different standard, but on a preliminary injunction standard, and it had shown, it determined that plaintiffs have not shown a substantial likelihood of success on the merits of their claim under the First Amendment. We have a number of arguments in here, and I'm going to focus on what Judge Pittman's analysis, analysis, but I do want to highlight some of those arguments before I get to Judge Pittman. First is that 3D guns themselves are not an expressive act. And for that, I'm cited, relying on the Vartuli case that's cited in the briefs, because the nature of these guns is that you just press a button and it prints. So we don't believe that itself is an expressive act. Uh, one of our other arguments that we raise in our briefs is that these uh, these load files are integral to criminal conduct and are therefore exempt from the First Amendment. And there's some cases that we cite for that. But the gist of that is that with the Undetectable Firearms Act, as well as the state law restrictions, it, you know, it's illegal to possess a, a weapon such as a, a plastic gun. So therefore that the, uh, the, uh, these, these guns, excuse me, the, the files are so tied to that, uh, to those plastic guns that they themselves have no First Amendment protection. But what I want to focus most on is intermediate scrutiny or whether this is content neutral, as Judge Pittman had determined. Uh, before we get there, though, we need to look at this issue of a prior restraint, because uh, the private defendants have uh, claimed that if there's a prior re restraint, that strict scrutiny automatically applies. But that's just not so in the case law. Uh, as Judge Pittman cited, uh, the standard review for analyzing uh, prior restraint restraints uh, 
there's different standards that have to, uh, of review depending on the restraint at issue. Because while there's a heavy presumption against the validity, that's not a standard review in itself. And he cites, for instance, the Seattle Times case, where uh, there was a prior restraint, but strict scrutiny was not applied. Uh, following Judge Pittman's analysis, uh, he determined that the law is content neutral. And he did so because the ITAR does not regulate disclosure of technical data based on the messages communicating. And that's exactly our position as well. Because you know, the fact that uh, some of these private defendants are in favor of global access to firearms or, or have some other agenda is not the basis for regulating the export of the computer files at issue. The motivation of the government, as the government said itself in its brief, is, is it's not the product of, of, of hostility towards their ideas or the spread of 3D printing technology, but it's the very means to easily do so. Uh, so I believe that intermediate scrutiny applies here because it's content neutral. And if there is intermediate scrutiny, again, I'm going to follow Judge Pittman's reasoning here. Uh, there's a substantial government interest in regulating the dissemination of military information and combating terrorism, and there's numerous cases on that point. We believe that the uh, regulations here are narrowly ta tailored. There's a procedure to challenge it with a CJ, and uh, the, de de the declaration from uh, Ms. Aguirre indicated that most uh, uh, CJs are granted. I mean, by that I mean you're allowed to uh, export the item. And then finally, there are alternative av avenues uh, to, uh, to produce this information. But here, notably, I, uh, it only applies to internet posting. They can hand them around uh, in domestically. Uh, and also, th there's a, a wide exception in the statute for general scientific, mathematical, or engineering papers. I would note that the, the Judge Pittman's decision relied on a Ninth Circuit case, which we again believe controls this, the Chimak case uh, from Ninth Circuit in 2012, where the Ninth Circuit quoted, uh, quote says, it repeatedly rejected First Amendment challenges to the AECA, its implementation regulations in its predecessor statute. So again, we believe that uh, that decides the issue with the First Amendment, but the, your honor only has to reach these issues as, it, as it, on the balancing of the equities test for an injunction. Moving on to the balancing of the equities, uh, we believe there's a present, uh, the public safety, there's a real and present danger to the public safety. Uh, the president seems to agree and the preliminary injunction, if it were issued, as with the temporary restraining order, will not harm the government. It will just put us back to where we were before this all happened. Now, as to the First Amendment issues that have been raised by uh, the private defendants, I just addressed them there. And, you know, they didn't have these ability to uh, publish uh, for five years here. And just continuing it on while this litigation proceeds, uh, we don't believe will cause much harm when compared with the irreparable harm that the states uh, would, would, would suffer, as demonstrated by our declarations. I don't have any further unless Your Honor has any questions. I'll catch you in rebuttal. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Myers. <clears throat> thank you, Your Honor. The federal government agrees that undetectable plastic firearms pose a significant risk to domestic public safety. The Department of Justice is fully committed to vigorously enforcing the Undetectable Firearms Act. How, how do you vigorously enforce an act to find undetectable guns until that gun ends up being used? How do you proactively stop and find those things? Your Honor, uh, federal law enforcement is involved in finding all kinds of illicit contraband, undetectable firearms, unlawful drugs, any number of things. The federal government has a lot of experience doing that. Right, but, you know, we don't just wait for the heroin to be produced and then try to find it. We say it's against the law to produce the heroin. Correct, We'd, Your Honor. We, if and we have something that, by definition, is undetectable and untraceable, wouldn't it make sense that it should not be manufacturable? And, and to be clear, Your Honor, it is unlawful to produce an undetectable firearm. Just Great. as in, in other contexts, it's unlawful to produce illegal drugs. So, so that is our point. It is unlawful to produce an undetectable firearm. And it's the Undetectable Firearms Act that is the basis for that illegality. And the government is fully committed to enforcing that statute. It's also fully committed to enforcing other prohibitions on firearms ownership by people who are ineligible to own firearms, felons, those who are judged mentally ill, and others. But the fact that a weapon is dangerous domestically and that there's a basis to regulate it domestically 
doesn't mean that it provides a critical military or intelligence advantage, which is the standard that applies when the State Department exercises its authority under the Arms Export Control Act. So are you saying it never should have been there in the first place? Your Honor, the, the key event uh, from the government's perspective is the May notices of proposed rulemaking from State and Commerce that reflect the government's judgment that non-automatic firearms sub-50 caliber do not present a critical military or intelligence advantage. So and no, I'm not saying it never should have been. But we, we now have a new proposed modification that will take those all those weapons off the table as far as the Export Control Act goes. Correct. And um, I didn't require production of the record under this tight time schedule because I didn't want you worrying about that. But um, at some point, the question of whether this was you know, the bureaucracy at work, but not noticing that it affected 3D printed weapons, or my goodness, let's get these 3D weapons unregulated, and this is the way to do it, does become important, doesn't it? Your Honor, if this case, assuming this case proceeds, and, and we're directed to produce an administrative record. Um, everything that, you know, is, is part of the record will be, will be before the court. And well, do you know the answer to the question? Was it, uh, did somebody notice that this modification is going to change the 3D gun thing or, uh, and, and it was part of the process or we just wanted to change the 50 caliber or less, non-automatic, and we didn't even think about the 3D printing? Your Honor, I think the face of the documents that we've relied on and, and put before the court suggest that there's been a, a years-long effort to revise the United States munitions list. And as part of that, the judgment has been made that sub-50 caliber non-automatic firearms ought not be regulated under the AECA and ITAR. And that judgment extends to conventional firearms or, or plastic firearms, provided that they are non-automatic and sub-50 caliber. To be clear, even if the court were to grant plaintiffs every ounce of relief that they seek in this case, Defense Distributed could still mail every American citizen in the country the files that are at issue here. And what that gets at, and, and what I really want to underscore, is the fundamental disconnect between the claims that plaintiffs are asserting here and the statutory regime that's at issue. Again, there are domestic uh, prohibitions on undetectable firearms, on firearm possession, some of those are federal, some of those are state, and all of those remain on the books and, and capable of being enforced. But plaintiffs are trying to rely on the wrong statutes. So let me start by talking about plaintiffs' theory of injury, which is relevant to their claims of both standing and irreparable harm. Their main argument is that as a result of these files being available, that's going to lead to the proliferation of undetectable guns. Again, that harm, that potential harm, is not properly traceable to the regulatory action that's at issue here. If those harms occur, it will be because of separate violations of separate statutory prohibitions. Plaintiffs similarly try to question defendants' national security judgments, but the federal government's judgment is that the risk of small caliber weapons of this kind does not uh, justify their regulation under the Arms Export Control Act. And that judgment, the federal government's national security judgment, to the extent it's reviewable at all, is entitled to significant deference from the court. Plaintiffs uh, make the observation that the states are the United States, and I suppose that's true in some sense, of course, but the federal government has principal responsibility for ensuring the national security of the country, and the Arms Export Control Act is, is part of that. That's the function of that statute. With respect to abrogation of state laws, Plaintiffs say that somehow the federal government is interfering with their ability to enforce their state laws, but that's just not so. We are not suggesting that the actions at issue here undermine or preempt state law in any respect. Plaintiffs are just as able to enforce those laws today as they were a year ago. As I've tried to, to indicate, this, um, this fundamental mismatch between what plaintiffs are concerned about and the statute on which they're relying also really undermined their, undermines their prudential standing. As a matter of prudential standing, they need to show that their claims are in the zone of interests of the statutory provision upon which they rely. But as the Ninth Circuit has made clear, the Arms Export Control Act is designed to, and I'm quoting, 
protect against the national security threat caused by the unrestricted flow of military information abroad. That's the United States versus Posey case from the Ninth Circuit. The vast majority of the harms that they're talking about are purely domestic harms that are properly the subject of domestic regulation, but they're not relevant to the foreign affairs concerns of the Arms Export Control Act. And again, plaintiffs are not able and should not be able to second guess the executive's national security determinations. That is the essential function of the federal government, not state governments. Unless your honor has questions on what I've said so far, I'll turn to the likelihood of success on the merits of their APA claims. Go ahead. Their primary argument is this 30 day notice provision that arises from 22 USC section 2278 F. And what that statute says is that before items are removed from the, from the munitions list, there needs to be 30 days notice to Congress. Your Honor can simply look at the United States munitions list to see that nothing, no items have been removed from the munitions list. The munitions list consists of 21 categories and then there are items within those categories. And the items, for example, in category one are things like non-automatic and semi-automatic firearms to caliber 50 or combat shotguns or silencers, mufflers and flash suppressors. Again, all of those items are still there. The USML has not changed at all as a result of the actions challenged here. What the July 27 notice did was temporarily exclude very specific technical data from the scope of the USML and essentially meant that uh, the USML would not be applied as to those specific files uh, pertaining to those specific articles. But again, the items on the USML remain exactly the same. The Haidema Declaration, which we've submitted, uh, makes clear that the government has consistently, since at least 2011, understood uh, the statute's use of the term items in exactly that way. And it further makes clear that Congress has been put on notice that, that that's how the State Department understands the statute. And so that understanding is entitled to some degree of deference from this court. Indeed, 22 CFR section 126.2 specifically contemplates, contemplates temporary suspensions of the regulations as to particular articles. And so what I think plaintiffs are really suggesting is that that regulation is an impermissible interpretation of the statute. And that regulation uh, is likewise entitled to some degree of deference as a reasonable construction of what the statute means. Plaintiffs further say that defendants have violated the executive order, uh, which requires the concurrence of the Secretary of Defense. First of all, uh, that claim only can go forward if there has in fact been a change to items or categories of items. And so in a certain sense, it's duplicative of the notice to Congress claim that I was just discussing. In addition, section, section 6C of the executive order is explicit that it does not create rights that are enforceable at law against the United States, which is not the case in the authority upon which plaintiffs uh, have relied to try to say that they can litigate under the executive order. And finally, the Heidemann Declaration makes perfectly clear that the Defense Department has been consulted throughout this process, both with respect to the notices of proposed rulemaking, which would exclude all um, which would remove all non-automatic small caliber firearms from category one uh, and specifically with respect to the subject files that are at issue here. Finally, with respect to plaintiff's arbitrary and capricious claim, we submit that the notices of proposed rulemaking directly answer that claim. Those notices of proposed rulemaking make clear that the federal government has been involved in a years long process to determine what kinds of weapons present a critical military or intelligence advantage. And they further reflect the government's judgment that small caliber non-automatic firearms of a kind that you can buy in essentially any gun store in the United States do not present such a critical military or intelligence advantage. And so we think that answers their arbitrary and capricious claim. Of course, you cannot buy a 3D printed gun in any firearm store in the United States that's undetectable and untraceable, can you? No, Your Honor, that would be a vi if it were undetectable and untraceable, that would be a violation of the undetectable yeah. firearms act. And so I, where I, what I keep coming back to, Mr. Myers, is saying we're just doing this gross category of 
under 50 caliber non-automatic uh, because that has no defense or international implications may apply to every other weapon but does it apply to a 3D uh, gun that's undetectable and unprintable and if you look at the government's positions in the case in front of Judge Pittman in Texas they kept saying this is different this is serious this could be utilized uh, in ways that have a direct impact on our country because of the proliferation in foreign lands, the fact that people who don't have our best interests in mind can get the guns and then come in with them or use them uh, to get on airplanes, uh, and we could end up with other kinds of 9-11 situations or shoe bomber situations, that this was a very serious issue in and apart from the 50 caliber issues and what what about I mean you keep wanting to say that's just not part of the process um, uh, it's not what we were talking about if it happens to implicate that we'll deal with it in the way we deal with law enforcement in general and that doesn't comfort people because we already see mentally ill people get their hands on guns and 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 have mass shootings we already see people who are felons get their hands on guns. We see people who are not entitled to have guns get their hands on guns. We see children shoot other children with what they think are toy guns. And my goodness, these plastic guns look even more like toy guns. Where's the recognition? It seemed to be coming somewhat from the president that, wait a minute, this is a different matter. And Sarah Sanders, uh, we're glad that the judge put a little stop in this so we can take a better look at it. Where's the better look at it? Your Honor, since, since Your Honor entered the TRO, the government has been further studying and further looking into this issue. Uh, as, as the press secretary, I think, indicated, she was, or the president was, was, you know, was welcoming that opportunity. That further look has concluded that the government's position on this issue has not changed. And the position of the United States is the position that we've set out in the brief that was filed in this court. Okay, so that review internally in the executive branch did occur and the decision was made not to change the position? There has been no change in position since okay. we filed our TRO brief and since we filed the PI brief and, and this morning's hearing. Right, well my question was a little bit different though. I understand there's been no change, but was that decision not to make a change at the highest levels of the executive branch or we just don't know why it wasn't? Your Honor, I can't really speak to who or where in the executive branch considerations you know, have or haven't taken place. I can say that the position I'm articulating today is the vetted authorized position of the United States government. Great. Thanks, Mr. Myers. I don't want to stop you. You moving on to anything else? Uh, Your Honor, I think, I think all I would add or all I would just underscore is, is the government understands all of the harms and, and issues that Your Honor has just identified. Again, we understand that undetectable plastic firearms are a serious security threat. The Department of Justice takes the issue seriously, is committed to vigorously enforcing statutes that deal with those topics. We just don't think that the Arms Export Control Act is the relevant statute here. And as far as the First Amendment issues go, the government, the federal government has never taken a position that anything that had to do with the Arms Export Control Act implicated First Amendment issues, correct? We've denied liability on the First Amendment claim. And even the settlement with Defense Distributed didn't admit to any First Amendment violations. It continues to deny liability. Okay. Right. And you, you understand that you and the private defendants do separate on this last issue that you talked about. They, they want everyone to have an undetectable, untraceable gun because they, at least according to the, Mr. Wilson, that's the way they will protect themselves from an overbearing, over-controlling um, government. Uh, and uh, so you're not on the same page on that. Again, the Department of Justice is fully committed to enforcing all federal criminal laws that regulate these topics. Thanks, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Flores. Thank you, Your Honor. We appreciate the court's indulgence in letting us brief and argue this case as something of a bystander. We should probably start by recognizing that as the court correctly saw at the TRO stage, 
and as we see in footnote one of the motion, the plaintiffs don't seek any relief against us in this case, and so we have views we'd like to express, but our role is a unique one. I think it's also critical to acknowledge that what we heard from both counsel for the plaintiffs and the government is that my clients could mail the files at issue to anyone in the country and violate no law. And so really what we're talking about isn't the quest question of whether, but how much, how much of this activity can occur due to the use of the internet. And I think that's a critical thing to realize when we're looking at things like irreparable harm and the evidence that you look at from the plaintiffs. When you decide whether or not to enter an injunction, you can't look at evidence of all of the activity that's going on. You have to look at the marginal increase that would be an issue in this case because of this particular set of parties. I don't really want to get into the merits of a lot of the discussion. You actually want to focus on a procedural point, and that is that this isn't an up or down question of whether or not to continue the TRO and whether or not the temporary modification should stay in place. I think that in order to sign the order that they've drafted for you, you would need to conduct the analysis, the full analysis of standing and the merits and irreparable harm and the constitutional claims at least four times. Because remember, the temporary modification doesn't just apply to 3D guns generally. We're talking about very particular files that are defined consistently throughout the actions. You have four categories. Category one is the published files, which is a defined set of um, expression. Category two is the ghost gunner files. Category three is the CAD files. And category four is the other files. And the procedural point I have to make is that we have very strong arguments that apply to many of these. And the plaintiffs have some okay counter arguments. I acknowledge there are close arguments. But I think that at worst, you're going to have to split the baby here. For example, I think our best argument is that the cat is out of the bag as to the files that are already online. There is an enumerated list of 10 files at issue. These belong in the category of the published files and the CAD files that are already available online, no matter what happens in this case. And so we think that takes out their case, both at a standing level and at a, a traceability um, level. And they have an answer. And their answer is yes, but the order also concerns other files that don't exist yet. That may be the case. I have other answers as to other files, but that means you can't issue an injunction as to the matters that are already out in the public domain. And so throughout the analysis, they have to thread the needle all the way through as to all four pieces that we're talking about here. Now, on that last piece, the other files that don't exist yet, we do have a solution to that, and that's a standing problem. This is precisely the kind of speculative harm that isn't justiciable. Because remember, we don't know what files we're talking about. We're just imagining what could be created in the future by not us, but the people who we send expressive files to. And so that we think there doesn't have standing to assert. The standing analysis also needs to be divided, we think. We see three standing arguments, and I think only one of them is debatable, and that one really narrows the case. The first standing argument that we don't think they succeed on is this pure sovereign interest in the state's ability to enact their laws and to have their executive branch enforce those, enforce those laws. They can still do that for the reasons that my friend for the government explained. Right? That's not at risk here. The second kind of standing argument they have is this quasi-sovereign interest in protecting the safety of the citizens and making sure that there's a peaceable place to live. This is a parents patria argument the argument that the government can assert the general interest in the safety of its citizens. And as a matter of law, if that ever works, it only works vis-a-vis -vis the state and another state or a state and a private party. It does not run in an action against the government because when there are two governments, only one of them can assert the interests of these people. And in this case, it's the federal government. So the best argument they have is actually not one that they can deploy against the government here. So then we come to the third standing piece and I think the most arguable point is about the jails and the notion that this may make jails more expensive. I don't think that gets them there. I think that's a speculative kind of claim. But if it does, remember that when you're balancing the equities, you're not balancing the harm of every citizen in the state. What you're balancing is the increased expense of new weapon detectors versus the balances on the other side. So these are two critical examples of how we can't just paint with a broad brush and say 3D guns, OK or not OK, we're talking about a very specific set of files. I have two more points that I want to make, Your Honor. One of them is a little bit in the weeds, and another um, is also a, sort of a separate issue. The first point is in the weeds of the merits of the case about whether a removal occurred. 
you heard an argument from the government that said the reason there haven't been procedural violations <coughs> is because an item isn't at issue here. We have a slightly different argument. Even if you think that an item is at issue, removal didn't occur. Because there is a difference between removing things from the list and supplying an exemption. And I'll start with an analogy and then I'll take you to the text. The analogy is, I am arguing before the court today, I haven't been admitted to the bar, there are rules that say I have to take and be a member of the Washington Bar, but I'm not, and yet I'm here. And the fact that I'm here, the court admitted me pro hoc, doesn't mean the court removed the requirement of bar admission from the usual way of getting into court. There's a separate system. And you can see this in the statute. At the top <coughs> level, it's at 2278G6. And that's what the statute says. The president can require a license or other form of authorization. And so you see this throughout the regulatory provisions that we go pretty deep into, into the briefs is that there isn't just one way to turn the switch on and off. The president has flexibility. This isn't removing anything. We're talking about an exemption. The last issue I want to talk about today is the matter that we filed with the court on Sunday night. And it's a question of subject matter jurisdiction. We are in the case <coughs> because the plaintiffs say that we're a necessary party. And I'm not sure that that is so. If the case continues, we'll have to litigate that. We'll have to litigate a lot of things. But according to the complaint, in paragraph 24, the reason we're in the case is because the relief that they ask for may affect the settlement agreement. And recall that the settlement agreement is a contract that involves <coughs> the United States as a party and my client, Defense Distributed. So they say we're here because something in this case is going to affect the contract. If that's so, we may have a Tucker Act problem. And the Tucker Act problem is that suits on contracts belong only in the Court of Federal Claims, and even when they can be brought in district court, no injunctive relief is available. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the plaintiffs mean when they say this case could affect our rights under the settlement agreement, and so maybe we can hear that in rebuttal. But if part of this case entails changing the obligations of the settlement agreement, the court <coughs> has to take a hard look. We've given the court, I think, a, a starting point for that analysis, right? Textually, this would be a question of 1491 on whether the case is founded upon the contract, and maybe it's not, in which case we would acknowledge if it's not founded upon that, then we're out. But it's a matter of subject matter jurisdiction, and I wanted to bring it to the court's attention because of our somewhat attenuated role in the case. Unless the court has further questions, we'll yield the remainder of our time. Thanks very much, Ms. Flores. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Even if it's under an exemption. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, um, Mr. Rupert. I, I don't think I'll need to hear from Mr. Sprung, so. Okay, thank you. You know, we've had a discussion of statutory schemes and going through all the elements, but I do want to highlight what's at issue here. I mean, we have, for instance, moms demand action in the courtroom here. I mean, the public is very concerned about these 3D weapons and the potential harm that they could cause. So I want to focus on the irreparable harm, but I will certainly address the points that are made, but I think that is what drove our action, and I think uh, is one of the f defining features of this case is all of the undisputed evidence in the record demonstrating irreparable, irreparable harm, both from the states as well as the federal government before it made this change. Now, we heard a number of things from the federal government, which I think we have addressed many of them uh, uh, on my initial presentation, but I'll just highlight a few. We heard again this idea that items, removal of items is in fact a category. Uh, and again, I, I think we would point to largely what we did before. If you look at particularly the executive order that refers to items or categories of items, that interpretation just doesn't find support. I would also highlight the declarations from the congressmen uh, who certainly believe that uh, they were required to give notice for this. Uh, there was this also this idea that there was not a removal of items. Well, I, I submit that when you exclude items, that is in fact a removal. Uh, and uh, I don't think that bears a lot of discussion unless Your Honor has questions about that. I, I do want to highlight the arbitrary and capricious claim. Uh, you know, we had some discussion. I thought Your Honor has some very good questions because it's the exact points that we're making here that if they're going to justify this or attempt to justify uh, this decision about 3D guns, uh, they can't do it by referring to a, a rule that's not yet final. And then even in that rule, as Your Honor identified, it seems to have been a broad category, and we don't know why, what the reasoning was, if it was either just administrative oversight or, or if it was an intentional decision. But either way, when you look at the justifications in the Heidemann Declaration for making that rulemaking proposed change, again, not final, 
Uh, it's that the items are readily available. And it's obvious that you know, 3D guns are not readily available. And as the government then notes that, in fact, it would be illegal to possess it. So we have a disconnect there, and we believe that demonstrates very vividly the arbitrary and capricious nature of the government's action here. Now, we have the private defendants uh, kind of pointing out that there were a number of files at issue here and wanting a separate analysis for those. Uh, I would just point to Judge Pittman's analysis. That's the one that we have followed. And just, I believe, Judge Pittman uh, readily addressed that issue there. So I think the court can look to Judge Pittman for that. And then there's this also this, uh, I'll call it the uh, cat out of the box argument, that the idea that, well, some of these files are out there on the web, so that means that, you know, whatever we're here doing today is for no good. Uh, I fundamentally disagree with that. I mean, it's one thing to have them out there on the far reaches of the Internet, but it is a far different thing to have them readily available for anyone to find. So I do think that, you know, this temporary restraining order that your honor has issued, as well as potentially a preliminary injunction, has a real effect in preventing the harm that we've identified. And again, we have declarations supporting, you know, our position, and we have speculation on the other side. Uh, we also have this question that, well, this idea that, you know, one of the things we focused on is like, we have certain files right now, but then what the government has done with the temporary modification is open up all kinds of 3D gun files that will come. They go, well, it's too speculative. Well, again, let's look at the record. We have Professor Patel talking about the advances that are going to come in 3D printing, so it's not speculative at all. Then uh, finally, we, there was a question about standing, but you know, the, the standing analysis or argument overlooks the case law, the special solicitude case law, which is Massachusetts versus EPA and Texas versus the United States, which recognize that. I would point your honor to that. That's in our briefs as well. And even the private defendants recognize that the proprietary standing is a much closer call. We would say it's an easy call. But if our metal detectors, like the one that's downstairs, are no longer effective, we're going to have to get something new. And that doesn't come for free. Or the other alternative is start going back to hand searches, which are going to present some issues of their own about just trying to get everybody through uh, and all kinds of other situations that are going to arise if you're going to have to search everyone by hand and pat them down. It's going to take a lot more manpower, so we have proprietary standing right there. And then finally, I'll address this, this uh, uh, subject matter issue that's been raised in this last minute filing with just this case. Um, this is not a contract case. Uh, we said that last time we were here. This is an APA case. I mean, the reason we had, uh, included them in, in the case is that when we balance the equities, well, they may have an interest in that. And so we wanted them to be heard, and, uh, and they are here making their arguments. But at the end of the day, this is not a contract case at all. We are attacking the government's decision uh, to allow these 3D guns to be readily available in the administrative process there. We're not attacking the settlement agreement itself. And there may be contractual issues between defense distributed and the federal government uh, based on the settlement agreement, but it's not in front of me and it's not part of this lawsuit is what you're saying. That's correct, Your Honor. I agree with that. Yeah. But it's, I'm glad to, to have Mr. Flores and his client here to express a point of view that obviously the federal government isn't willing to, to go that far. So it's very useful to have them here. But I, I agree with you. I'm not touching any contract issue in the case. Okay. Um, you know, it's a little bit frustrating um, to be uh, sitting in this chair as a United States District Court judge and seeing this is an issue that should be solved by the political branches of government and uh, you know like I say when the issue came before me on July 30th and I had to make a decision on July 31st uh, on probably the most significant case that I've handled as a United States District Court judge and having the shortest amount of time possible <laughs> to rule on the case that was one thing but where are the political branches to step up and deal with an important issue like this. And it's very frustrating uh, because uh, there are justifiable criticisms of who is this federal judge out in Seattle going to make such an important decision. And I'm not going to make an important decision about these issues that you've raised. It's not for me to do. But it is for me to determine did the federal government follow their rules uh, in making the modification and sending the letter.
and I will deal with those in that technical arena. But um, a solution to the greater problem is so much better suited to the other two branches of government, and I really hope and wish that the executive branch and Congress would face up to this and say it's a tough issue, but um, that's why you got into public service to begin with. But um, thanks very much. Did you have anything else, Mr. Rupert? I did not, Your Honor. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take the matter under advisement. There's uh, some excellent briefing uh, and issues that I want to take a closer look at. Uh, I will definitely get a written decision out by Monday, August 27th, uh, so you'll have it for sure before the expiration of the TRO on the 28th. Okay? Thanks very much, Council. Thank you.